Hi, I'm Thomas Ryan, and I'm hosting Shoreline's brand new podcast. During our Intellectual Barriers to Faith series, we'll be asking some big questions. So we called in some folks from Shoreline's community who operate in an intellectual setting every day. We'll be talking about being an intellectual Christian in the world of science, academics, military leadership, law, even an Ivy League university. Here's a quick sample of my conversation with this week's guest, Jim Woodard, a chemist and geologist working right here in Monterey. Sometimes I feel like people, uh, science might be a, a bad word for Christians, but but you're a Christian, you're a scientist. What, what's what's the deal with that? Well, I, I've I've liked both for as long as I can remember, whether it be just trying to figure out how things work or you know just studying the Bible. So these two things have been a big part of my life ever since I was young. The best part about it, I think having science with Christianity is you have this real perspective about how long things are in the works. Mm-hmm. You know, even if you just take a look at your what happens in your life, lot, not a lot of the physical world will change, but it's been in the works to get to you your point now. And so that that that's where I would say it's it's nice to have the Christian background. It's nice to have the the scientific background because you'd appreciate both. Yeah, you get to say thank you and say ooh cool. What's an encouragement you have for for us as we as we wrestle with these problems? I, I would say. I would say the first thing is that you are not the only person to have wrestled. You are not the only person to have looked and not immediately understood everything that's around you. And you don't have to have an answer for anything and everyone. I think people respect you much more for knowing that you are okay and humble enough to let give things credit where it's due or where, you know, where you uh, where your knowledge ends and where you need to do more research. That includes scientific and non-scientific topics alike. Again, everybody will say, well, there's alternative theories for it. Mm -hmm. Or they'll say, you weren't there. Most of our discussions are are based on having some sort of acceptance of secondary information. Mm -hmm. I didn't perform all the experiments previous in science to get to where I am. I accepted the other ones as truth, and I moved on to keep progressing it. You know, a lot of Christians can do the same thing with their biblical faith, too. Yeah. You know, they don't have to become a super theologian and reinvent and, and defend everything. They can take somebody else's good, hard-earned work, you know, and and take that and then continue to use it and apply it. And for Christians, it's less about progressing it and adding on. We don't add on to the Bible. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's got plenty enough to work with. The, you know, but it's about applying it yeah. and applying it in a new way. Uh, and, you know, at Shoreline, you know, it's reaching out to as many people as possible and about getting as many people as possible to become totally committed to Christ. And matching that mission statement is the evolution of that field. Yeah, That's always what it's going to be. And so if you're a scientist in that frame, you can't be afraid afraid of, of telling the truth, which is, as a scientist, yes, you should tell the truth. Yeah. <laughs> and same thing for as, as, a, as a Christian. And it, sometimes the truth is, I don't know. Yeah, And that's okay. To hear the full 45-minute conversation Jim and I had, make sure to check out our podcast. You can find it online at shorelinechurch.org. Go to the resources tab, click on media, and scroll down. Or you can access it on your phone, tablet, or computer through iTunes. Just go to the iTunes store or podcast app and search Shoreline Community Church. So listen to those podcasts, download them, share them with friends, and get yourself thinking about these things. In the coming weeks, we're going to be in a series called Intellectual Barriers to Faith. What we're going to do is we're going to acknowledge with honesty that there are some big barriers that some people bump into in how they think and how they see the world and how they see the Bible, how they see God. And they'll be going along, and all of a sudden they're going to hit this barrier, and they say, you know, I can't get over this. I can't get around it. I have a hard time believing in a God who would, or I have a hard time believing in God at all. And and, and I want to be very clear. Uh, These are real, fair, intellectual barriers. In the coming weeks, we're not going to make light of them. We're not going to make fun of them. We're going to look at them. We're going to talk about them. We're going to think together. And we're going to identify those sorts of things that if, if you take good Christian thinking and good intellectual, logical thinking and faith, how can those things fit together? Some of the questions we're going to ask in the coming weeks are this. Today we're going to talk about this. Are intellectual pursuit and faith friends or foes? 
Can you, be, can you be a good, logical thinker and be a person of deep Christian faith and hold to the Bible? Some people say, absolutely not. That's ridiculous. Some people say, they absolutely fit together. Question that we'll ask next week is this. Aren't all sincere religious expressions equally valid paths to God? Some people bump into an intellectual kind of barrier to Christianity when they, when they hear Christians say, well, there's only one way to God, through Jesus. Shouldn't all the different religious systems be equally valid? And they say, I have a hard time with the exclusiveness of this Christian message. That's a fair question. That's a legitimate barrier. We're going to talk about that. We're going to look at it together. The following week, we're going to have a man here named Gary Thomas. Gary's come and spoken to us before. Uh, Gary is, I think, one of the finest thinkers in the Christian world today. Gary is absolutely brilliant. But he's also down to earth, very warm person. He'll be speaking for us two weeks from now. Three weeks from now... We're going to ask the question, isn't it enough to say that Jesus was a good man or a good teacher, a good moral teacher? Why do you have to believe that he is God to be a Christian? Some people bump into that intellectual barrier. They say, I can see Jesus being a prophet, a nice guy. But, you know, Christians in the Bible say that Jesus was God. That's a barrier for me, God becoming a person. We're going to talk about that. We're going to look at that barrier with intellectual, intellectual integrity. And then the last week in this series, we're going to ask this question. If God is loving, truly loving, how can he allow evil and suffering in the world? A lot of people bump into that barrier where you say God's a loving God, and yet look at the mess this world is in, all the evil and all the pain. How does that work? And some people bump into that barrier of the presence of evil and pain in the world, and they say, I just can't get over that and believe in a God of love in light of the evil in the world. In these coming weeks, we are going to think together. We're going to look at what the Bible says about these things. We're going to grapple with it together. And I hope what we're going to discover is that, is that good intellectual thought with integrity and a real heart that loves God and believes the Bible can actually fit together. I want to pray and ask God to lead us in these coming weeks. Let's pray together. Lord, there are people gathered here today that, that have put their faith in you, they believe in you. There's people sitting here today that are here because their spouse wants them here, because their parents want them here, or because they're exploring, trying to fig figure out if this is all true. Lord, we pray that you'll meet us in these coming weeks, that we can look with honesty at real barriers, real challenges, that we can think well and deeply and discover that Christianity and intelligent thought not only can go hand in hand, they belong together. Speak to us in these coming weeks. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our question today is, are intellectual pursuit and faith friends or foes? Are, are, they, are they friends or foes? Do, do, do they? Get, so here's the picture. Intelligent, intellectual, sound, logical thinking and faith in Jesus, belief in the Bible, and holding the Christian faith. Do these two things have to be like this? Do they fight each other or can, can intelligence, intellectual pursuit, logical thinking, and faith in Jesus, belief in the Bible, and holding the Christian faith, can they be like this? Can they be friends? Can they fit together? I believe absolutely that, that intellectual thought and faith can fit together beautifully. And here's one of my pet peeves, one of the things that just drives me crazy. When I talk with a Christian... And they'll be talking about somebody that they really care about. Somebody that they really love. And, and they say, you know, that person, I want them to know Jesus. I want them to open their hearts to know and to love Jesus. I want them to have a relationship with this living God that I've come to meet. But they're really resistant to becoming a Christian because, they'll say, you know, because they're really smart. Which would say, all of those who've become Christians are kind of... Fill in your own word. It's like, and I want to say, I want to say, really? That's really, you think that they, that you can't become a Christian if you're smart? And I think, I just think that misses the point entirely. And so, and so uh, I did a little bit of, just a little bit of study, a little research, I, and I looked at a lot of different people. But I want to introduce you to a few people. These are people who are, listen closely, really, really smart, intelligent, have intellectual integrity, and they also are people who believe the Bible and who love Jesus. Let me introduce you to a few of them. Here's the first one. Benjamin S. Carson. A ben Carson, born in Detroit, raised in poverty by a single mom, got his bachelor's degree in psychology from Yale, an MD from the University of Michigan. He became the director of pediatric neurosurgery 
at John Hopkins University at the age of 33. Wicked smart, all right? And he was the first surgeon to successfully separate conjoined twins at, that were joined at the back of the head. He's pioneered surgical techniques that have now become the standard in the field of neurosurgery. Smart, logical, intellectual in the medical field. And he loves Jesus and believes the Bible. Meet Ben Carson. William Lane Craig. William Lane Craig, a bachelor's degree from Wheaton College, two master's degrees, a PhD in philosophy, and a PhD, in, a, a doctorate in theology. A bachelor's, two master's, two doctorates. Can anybody say somewhat excessive? I want, but, but just smart guy, right? Has taught at many different schools. In 2011, he made headlines when Richard Dawkins, a famous atheist, refused to appear to debate with him at Oxford University. And the reason is, William Lane Craig is just flat out brilliant. Amen. And a committed Christian. Person number three. And this is a, just a sampling of way more. Actually, you can come and look at my notes if you want to. Or contact Ramel and she'll send you all these different people I couldn't get to. Condoleezza Rice. Condoleezza began learning French, music, ballet, and figure skating at the age of three. At the age of three, I'm not sure what I was doing, but it wasn't any of that, all right? <laughs> uh, classical pianist, once played, uh, accompanied Yo-Yo Ma, famous musician. Bachelor's degree, master's in political science uh, from Notre Dame. Studied Russian at the University of Moscow. PhD in political science. Also loves Jesus, believes the gospel, believes the Bible. Taught at Stanford University. Uh, became the National Security Advisor and then the Secretary of State for the United States of America. And now is presently a professor of political science at Stanford and also holds a number of chairs in places of real influence. In the world of education, in the world of politics, brilliant mind, intellectual integrity, loves Jesus, believes the Bible. One more. Alistair McGrath, born in Belfast, Northern Ireland, undergraduate education in mathematics, physics, and chemistry, and then a doctorate in, from Oxford in molecular biophysics. Also, another doctorate of divinity, of theology, from Oxford, and presently is the chair of theology, ministry, and education in the Department of Education and Professional Studies at King's College London. Has written dozens of books. The, one of the first writing projects I ever did, I was 28 years old, I was given a manuscript by a guy named Alistair McGrath, this guy, I'm 28 years old, and, and a publisher gives me this manuscript, and they say, listen, it's brilliant, it's amazing. You need to cut it by 40 pages and make it understandable for normal human beings. <laughs> Edit this. That was one of my, my first writing projects I ever did. Got to work with, and I, and I didn't know who this guy was. I read his bio. I read his back, and I'm like, I can't touch this. This guy's brilliant, you know. But they said, yeah, and, and, but you, this guy's brilliant. And, and then I'll give you a, one bonus one. Uh, there's a book, The Language of God, written by Francis Collins. Some of you may know this book. Some of you may not. Francis Collins, it says in the back here, is the head of the Human Genome Project, one of the world's leading scientists, not leading Christian scientists, one of the world's leading scientists in any field. He works at the cutting edge of the study of DNA, the code of life, yet he is also a man of unshakable faith in God and belief in the scriptures. And it goes on. Can you be smart, have intellectual integrity, think well, and be a person of deep faith? and belief in God, and confidence in the Bible? The answer is yes. And yet some people think that's not true. And, I, and what I want to do today is I want to watch, and if you're, if you're one of our note takers, you know that you already have your bullets out, you have your outline ready to fill in the blanks, and you're excited about that. It's going to be about 15 minutes till I get to anything that's on the sheet, so just, it's okay. We'll get to it, you'll fill in your blanks, okay? Uh, before we're done. And if you're not a note taker, you can take that out, and we'll get to that in a little bit. What I want to do today is I want to look at Acts chapter 17. If you have a Bible, turn to Acts chapter 17. And this is what I call a walk through Athens with a very smart guy who loved Jesus passionately. His name was the Apostle Paul. Saul, who became Paul, would have been on a list like the one I just gave you back in his day. Multilingual, highly educated, brilliant mind, trained by some of the finest minds of his time. Incredible debater, amazing with logic. And he loved Jesus gave his life to Jesus and by the Holy Spirit wrote many books of the New Testament. And we're going to walk with him into this intellectual center where he walks into this city, the city of Athens, 
We're going to be in, in Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 16. And we're going to walk together through this experience and see somebody who's brilliant, but also has a heart for Jesus and how these things can fit together. So the first thing, caring about people's hearts and minds. Verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them, some friends were going to join him. While Paul was waiting for his friends in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Athens, the, the, the streets in Athens were lined with idols, with statues made of wood and made of stone and made of metal that people worshipped and filled with temples of pagan gods. And the apostle Paul, the, the language there greatly distressed. The English doesn't capture it. He, he was in, in internal turmoil. Because he looked at Athens and he saw all these idols and all these temples and he realized that these people had religion or the form of religion or some of them just religious affiliation, but they didn't know God, his love, his presence, his power. So Paul's heart broke for those people and his mind, the wheels began to turn. How do you bring intellectual thought to an intellectual context and share the truth of faith and the love of God? And that's what we see kind of unfold in this passage. He's troubled about it. And then second, using reason in all places with all people. Paul would come with rational thoughts. So we read this in verse 17. So he, Paul, reasoned in the synagogue, the place of worship, with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day, with those who happened to be there. So Paul looks at this. His heart grieves over all the idolatry that people, people are following these idols, but they don't know who God is. They don't know God's love and grace. So it says he reasoned. He went to the place of religious gathering, the synagogue. And there was Hebrews, Jewish people there, but there was also Greeks who had become adherents of Judaism who were trying to understand who God was. And it says he reasoned with them. He thought with them. If you read the, the letters of the Apostle Paul, God inspired him by the Holy Spirit, but God used his mind and his intellect for logic and for reason to make sense of things. Read the book of Romans, an incredible logical progression of thought. And so he begins to reason with people in the church. But then it says, he also reasoned with people in the marketplace day by day with all those who happened to be there. He walks into the marketplace, the place of ideas, the place of thoughts. Back then, it would be a literal marketplace, a place where things were sold or where trading happened. But it was also a marketplace of ideas. The marketplace on the hills. And the Areopagus particularly was this one hill where the intellectuals of the day would gather and they would think together. They would talk together. They would grapple with deep thoughts. They would debate. They would, they would just think through things, and, and, and is this true? Isn't this true? And Paul goes there, and he reasons with them. His heart breaks for what's happening in the city, but his mind is ready to reason with people. He brings these things together. I think that's what we need. This is a great model for us as Christians today. It's not just all my emotions. It's not just all my mind. It's these things together. I mean, hasn't God told us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind? And that's what Paul's doing. He reasons with them. He explains things to them. And then sharing Jesus and knowing that not everyone will get it. As, as the Apostle Paul interacts, and this is over a series of days, he's talking with him. He's reasoning with them. But also Jesus comes into the discussion. And he knows that not everyone's going to get it. Not everyone's going to buy it. But he brings Jesus into the conversation because Jesus is the author of truth. So we read this in verse 18 a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with Paul. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? This? He's not even making sense to us. Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Paul is teaching about this Jesus who died and rose again and talking about the resurrection for all who put their faith in Jesus. Well, here's the challenge. The Epicurean philosophers were, were pure materialists. In the first century, the Epicurean philosophers believed that their bodies, the physical world existed. There was no spiritual world. There was no soul. So when you died physically, the matter of your body fell apart and decomposed, and that was it. And this guy's talking about Jesus who died and rose again and how we could rise again, and they didn't understand it. But Paul presented it in a way that was clear enough for them to get what he was saying and disagree with him. And that's fine. It's fine as a Christian to have a conversation with someone and disagree. As long as they understand what it is, you can articulate what you're thinking and articulate what the Bible is teaching. So the, the Epicurean philosophers were, were pushing back because they didn't believe in a resurrection. They didn't believe in a soul. The Stoic philosophers had a different worldview, had a different perspective on things. They were pantheists. They believed that all things are God. This is God. This is God. The river is God. The tree is God. I'm God. You're God. 
Both the Epicurean sense of materialism still exists in our world today. I have people in my family who believe there's no God, no soul. When your life ends, it's all done. But there's also people today that are in this sort of new age stuff, pantheism, where, well, there's a God, there's a divine spirit, and that divine spirit kind of exists in all of us and in the world. It's kind of Star Wars theology, the force kind of a deal. And, you know, it's just kind of that kind of thinking existed back then. So, so here's these philosophers, and Paul is sharing with a heart for God, but a mind, a brilliant mind. He's articulating the resurrection, the person of Jesus. Clearly enough that they could either agree or disagree, but they could understand what he was talking about. I think it's a great model for us. Christians should be thinking people and deeply feeling people. It's not one or the other. And these things don't have to be like this. They can be like this. They can fit together. So so Paul's presenting this. He's sharing with them. And then the next thing we see in this passage, in verses 19 to 21, believing that many people will be curious and open if we talk with intelligence and grace and refuse to be dogmatic and closed-minded. Christians put up walls and we create our own barriers when we are dogmatic and shallow thinking. This is what I believe. It's the only truth. You just shut up because you're wrong. Let's talk more. You know, well, no. And so Paul is meeting them on their ground, in their place, where they gather. He's talking with them. He's listening to them. And we're going to see as the passage goes on, he understands their background, their culture, their thinking. So we can interact with them. Now, we're, we're not all called to interact on this level. But if you know Jesus, you're called to love God with your mind and with your heart. Both. So we need to develop minds that think well. So verse 19. So then they took Paul and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus. Now the Areopagus, Areopagus was actually a hill. Sometimes it's called Mars Hill if they're using it. Ares was the, the Greek and Roman pantheon of gods. Ares had one and the other one had Mars as the god of war. And this hill was where they kind of worshipped and they, uh, that, that, that one of the pantheon. And so the Areopagus is the hill of Ares or Mars hill where they would gather to think. So they invite him to a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him, may we know, more, may we know uh, what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. They actually, here's the intellectuals that are saying, tell us more. We this is interesting. It make, you know, what you're saying, we understand the idea. It doesn't fit with our philosophy, but tell us more about it. And then parenthetically, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. They loved to get together and talk about new thoughts. So they actually say to Paul, Paul, will you come and talk more? I think that they opened the conversation because he was not closed-minded. He was not dogmatic. He would listen to them, and he could articulate what he believed. So they began to have a conversation together. I love this. This should, again, be a model for us, that, that that we think deeply and we can listen well to other people. And then studying and observing what other people believe and embrace and starting where they live. The Apostle Paul didn't just say, come to my, on my terms. He's in their town. He goes to their gathering place. He interacts with them. And in verse 22, we read this. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. That's logic. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. I'm going to explain to you who this God is that you don't know. Paul says, I've walked around your city, and you have all kinds of idols, wood and stone and gold and silver statues. Now, Paul knows these idols are lifeless, and they bring no hope. You have all kinds of places of worship, these temples to these gods. But he says, I, I noticed one worship space, one temple, one place, and the inscription said, to an unknown God. They were trying to cover all the bases. So they actually had a temple for the God in case we missed one. God, you know, the the God, we don't know who it is yet. Paul says, let me tell you about the God that you don't yet know about. Because Paul knows it's the one true God who can truly save their lives. Remember, the Stoics uh, were, were, were pantheists. They believed in sort of this life force. The Epicurean philosophers were really, to some degree, atheists. They were pure materialists. So you had people who were philosophers and even religious people who didn't really believe in God. Is it possible to sit in a place place of worship week after week and not believe in God? People do it all the time. People are sitting in church because their spouse wants them there, their parents want them there, their kids want them there. Or they're 
checking it out, trying to understand the message. Who is Jesus? What's the Bible say? Any week that I'm here preaching, I'm confident there's many people who don't yet believe in God or aren't sure if this is true or have some intellectual barriers. And you know what? That's great. There's no better place for you to be than in the church. Listening, learning, discovering. And one of the things we're going to keep doing at, at Shoreline is we're going to think about things. We're going to talk about things. We're going to let God touch our hearts, but also we're going to use our minds along the way in the process. And, and, and so he, he comes there. He presents his perspective. He's, he's looking and he sees, this, he sees this place, a temple to an unknown God. And he says, I want to tell you about the God that you don't know about. He actually understands their culture and their place enough to interact with them. Too often, if you become a Christian, what happens is we pull away from the world and the culture. We don't understand what's happening around us. And then we can't figure out why there's this barrier between us and those who are far from Jesus. Well, it's because we pulled ourselves away from the world. Now, we shouldn't live in the world and do all the stuff the world does, but we should understand this world we live in. As Christians, we should be intelligent enough to know our culture and know what's happening around us, and God wants us to. And then sharing faith and belief with clarity and conviction, knowing that people are hungry to connect with God. Atheists are hungry to connect with God. They may not believe in God, but if you said to them, if there was a God who truly loved you, who could empower your life and give you grace and hope and peace, would you want to know that God? Almost anybody would say, well, yeah, I mean, I don't believe in that, but if that was true, of course I would. Who wouldn't? So, so, so Paul is presenting this God that many of them don't believe in, but he wants them to get a vision of who this God is. So we read this beginning in verse 24. The God who made the world, Paul says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. And he does not live in temples built by human hands. You got all these temples. God doesn't live in these temples. And he's not served by human hands. They had thousands of people serving in the different temples. He's, he, he's, he's not uh, served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else, everything you have, it's from this God. For one man, uh, for, uh, from one man, he made all the nations, that they would inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. And I love this. Though he is not far away from any one of us. Paul says, this God, this real God who made everything, who gave you your breath and everything you have, this God has put himself in a place that if you reach out to him, you can find him. And he says this, because he's not very far away. If you'll just reach out. I think reach out with your thoughts, reach out with your heart, all that you are, reach out to that God. So Paul gives this vision, reach out to this God. I love this. Paul is using logic, he's making sense, but he's presenting Jesus. And then knowing the literature, the culture, and the thinking of those we interact with. So then Paul, at this point, he's saying you can reach out to this God. He's closer than you realize. And then in verse 28, Paul says, For in him we live and move and have our being. And as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. In that one little verse, verse 28, Paul quotes two of their thinkers of the day, two of their poets. One, time, one quote is this, for in him we live and move and have our being. The other one is, we are his offspring. And so, so Paul, as he's speaking to them, he, he kind of connects with their language, with their people. He understands their culture, their art, their poetry. He hasn't distanced himself from the world and said, I want nothing to do with that. He understands how they think and where they come from. There's something about that. If you're a thinking Christian, and that, that, should, that should not be an oxymoron, that should be a definition to be a thinking Christian, to, to understand that, that God is as close as, as you know, we can imagine a dream, we can reach out to him, but, but also to understand that um, when we get, understand culture and art and music and all the things that are around us, that, that those things, we can speak those things as we talk with people. If we're out of touch with what's happening in the world, we're going to have a hard time presenting Jesus. And then the next thing, living with deep convictions and sharing these when appropriate, when it's sorry, organic, to have convictions of who Jesus is. So Paul has a conviction that the way to the Father is through Jesus. And he understands intellectually, he understands from his heart. So at the right moment, he talks about Jesus. Intelligent Christians who understand culture, who talk with people, who listen. This is over a period of days of interaction. We can put into words this message of Jesus. 
verse 29 to 30. Therefore, Paul says, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone. God is not an idol, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. He's calling his people to respond. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. He puts Jesus forward. In the name of Jesus, we need to repent. And he gives an invitation. Paul is logical. He's thoughtful. He understands their culture. He quotes their poets. He debates with them. They agree to disagree on some things. By the way, that's fine to do. I, di I agree to disagree with almost everybody I know on something, <laughs> including my wife. She's usually right, but I still agree to disagree. And you know, I mean, that's okay. They're having good intellectual conversation, but Paul is speaking not just from his mind, but also from his heart. He wants people to know this resurrected Jesus. So then finally... Living with an awareness that God will reach some through us, but others will reject the message of Jesus. Paul understands that he can talk intelligently, he can speak from the heart, he can interact with people, he can know their culture, he can present the message of Jesus in a way that makes sense, and some people won't get it. Some people won't embrace it. And that's okay. Because not, Paul can't remove someone else's barriers and make them believe. And neither can you, and neither can I. People have to open their hearts and their minds to say, is there a truth I don't understand yet? So Paul presented it with clarity and with passion, but he left it to them. It was Paul who says later in the book of Corinthians, we can scatter seed, we can water, God brings the growth, God changes lives, God removes the barriers. What we do is we talk intelligently and we speak from the heart and we bring those things together. So when they had heard about the resurrection of the dead, this is the response when they had heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. Ah, psh, are you kidding? This guy's out of his mind. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. What that means is they began to believe in the one Paul taught them about, Jesus. And they began to follow Jesus. Some sneered and some believed and embraced we need to live with an awareness that God will reach some through us, but that others will reject the message of Jesus. It's not up to us to make everyone believe. But, but here's what Christians should be doing. Christians should be using their minds. We should be intellectually consistent. We should be logical in how we think. We should be growing our minds and loving God with our minds. And Christians should also deeply, deeply feel the presence of Jesus. Jesus and have our hearts touched by his love and his grace. And our hearts should break for those who don't yet know how much God loves them. And we take these things and we bring them together. And we become more the Christians God wants us to be. So for those of you that are waiting to fill in some blanks on your notes, <laughs> get ready to write. Just, just I want to look at this idea how intellectual pursuit and faith can clash. Why is it then, if, if you can be an intelligent Christian, why is it then that there's this clash? Well, some of the clash comes from the side of Christians. There's some things we do, who are, we who are Christians do that are wrong and we need to stop doing. So here's, sometimes the clash is our problem. Here's some insights. First of all, there's a clash when Christians refuse to be logical and use their God-given intellect. There is a clash when, when Christians just aren't, we aren't thinking, we aren't reading and studying and going deeper and we aren't using our minds, we want it to all be heart-based. That creates a clash for people. A second reason, there's a clash. When Christians believe that all of faith is based on emotional, uh, emotion and personal experience. If we believe that all faith is just about my emotion and my personal experience, well, you should believe in Jesus because I really feel it. That's not enough. Now, should you feel deeply, and is that good and great and wonderful? Here's the answer. Yes. <laughs> but there's more. And if you think all of faith is just your feelings, you need to open this book and get into the Word of God and understand that God calls you to love Him with your mind as well as with your heart. Here's the third thing. I think there's a clash when Christians give simplistic answers to complex issues and questions. When we throw off simplistic answers to complex questions... So somebody says, 
You know, I can't, and we're going to be talking about this in a few weeks, I just can't believe in a God who's supposed to be this loving God, and yet all this evil happens in the world. And you say, you know, you just got to just love God anyways. Well, that's nice, but that hasn't addressed their issue, has it? We give a simple answer. You just got to believe. They say, but I don't believe in a God who's a loving God with all the evil in the world. What, are you not responding with your mind? You're saying, well, but just believe. And that, and that doesn't help. That actually in some ways gets in the way and reinforces the idea. And, and, and so, so sometimes even just to stop and say, why, why is that such a stumbling block for you? And then, and then they start to talk. This is why we talk with people. We intelligently interact with people. Maybe they say, well, you know, when I was seven, I went to church as a kid. When I was seven, my grandmother got cancer. And I prayed and prayed and prayed to God to heal my grandmother, and she died. And I said, right then, I will not believe in a God who would let my grandmother die. Now, all of a sudden, you go back to your answer, just believe. It seems kind of shallow, doesn't it? They're talking about something very real to them. But there are ways to think and understand our world and the reality of evil, that maybe it's not God who creates evil. There's a bigger story. We're going to get into that in a few weeks and talk about that. But, but here's the problem. We create conflict and a clash when we give simplistic answers to very complex questions. We shouldn't do that. Now, from the other side... Uh, and again, here, here's the passage, and I want to, you know, Jesus calls us to love God, and we have to say, I'm going to love God with all that I am. So Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. The first commandment of all, one of those things is love God with your mind. But I think there's also conflict and there's a clash when people who are not believers don't think well and don't behave well. It comes from both sides. Intellectual pursuit and faith will clash when, number one, Non-believers refuse to think deeply about things of faith. You have non-believers who have strong convictions about what's wrong with the Christian faith, and they've studied nothing. They watch the 10-minute YouTube show, and they go, I can't believe it because so-and-so said it's not true. And they're not, they're not intellectually really thinking it through. They heard somebody say something once in a college class, in a, in a first-year you know, psychology class or a first-year philosophy class, and they had a professor kind of beat on, on the Christian faith, and they just said, oh, I, I adopt that. And they haven't really thought about it. There's conflict because sometimes non-believers are not thinking deeply about things of faith. They're not open to those things. There's also conflict in a clash when non-believers give simplistic answers to complex issues of faith. There's complex issues of faith. There's non-believers that will say, well, you can't be an intelligent person and believe in the Christian faith. And yet, there's a list of people who are very intelligent people, way smarter probably than the person who declares that, who also believe deeply in the Bible and in Jesus and they hold the Christian faith. So sometimes non-believers will throw that off. They'll give simplistic answers to complex issues. And then finally, when non-believers dismiss all Christians as shallow and unthinking. And the media right now, there are, people, there are personalities in the media that'll say, Christians are just shallow, unthinking people. And this drives me crazy. And if I could somehow snap my finger and change the American media, I would. But it seems like almost every time the American media wants to put a Christian in front of a camera, they find somebody who is inarticulate, angry, and not a very good thinker. And so they don't think on their feet. So they get them saying really silly things in a really angry tone, and people go, oh, that's what those Christians are like. But you know what? It's not. Sherry and I get a chance in our ministry. We spent the last two weeks uh, leading conferences on outreach in three parts of New Zealand. We spoke and preached in three different locations three, uh, throughout the whole country, leaders from all over the country. Brilliant compassionate, articulate people, just like the people we meet at Shoreline, just like the Christians we meet all over the world. I think they have to look to find people to look as bad as some of these Christians look on show. They have to like dig around to find somebody that's that angry and that unable to string together two coherent sentences. But that's what the media wants people to think. It's not true. And I think, I think it's disingenuous and unfair for the media to try to present that when most Christians are thinking and loving and articulate people. Most of them are. So this is we wrap up. How do we bring these things together? And this is what we're going to be doing in the coming weeks. Intellectual pursuit and faith are friends when at least these three things happen. Here's one. When we realize that God gives us the ability to think and calls us to use our mind for his glory. We have to see the minds we have and our ability to think is actually a gift from God. And we're more the Christians he wants us to be when we use our minds, when we think deeply, when we dig into Scripture and think about it, when we understand culture and society, when we read broadly and think deeply. We'll be stronger as Christians. 
Second, when we discover that rigorous use of logic and academic pursuit, this is key, guided by integrity, will actually propel us toward God and not away from him. I absolutely believe that logic and academic, academic pursuit will lead people toward God if the academic pursuit has integrity. Now, a lot that happens in, in our American university system doesn't have integrity because at the very beginning they'll say, you can't believe in God, you can't believe in faith, and if you do, you're in trouble. That lacks integrity. It's supposed to be the, the, an open time for discussion and ideas, and they say, you can believe in anything, even any religion, just not Christianity. That lacks integrity. That lacks intellectual consistency and logic, but that's what happens in our culture. But if there's integrity and we do good academic thinking and logical thinking, I believe it actually leads us, pro propel us toward God instead of away from God. And then this. When we understand that God delights in the full development of our minds along with our souls. If we want to bring together reason and thought and our minds and our hearts and faith and passion and love and bring those things together, we have to understand that God takes delight when we grow our minds to think his thoughts and we grow our hearts to love him deeply. So let's pray and let's ask God to do that in these coming weeks. Living God, we thank you for a church like Shoreline where we can gather together, we can think together, we can worship and celebrate you together with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, but we can think with all of our minds. I pray for anyone here today who has intellectual barriers, that in these coming weeks that, that you will speak to their hearts and their minds, and draw them near to you. I pray for people here who have friends and family who push away from the faith because they think intelligent people can't love Jesus. And I pray that they would just come to see that actually some of those brilliant minds in the world today love you, Jesus. They believe the Bible. They know it's true. And I pray that those people would have the intellectual integrity to study and to think about things of faith, even as we should think about things that, that um, demand rigorous study and pursuit. God, grow our hearts, grow our minds, that we may love you fully. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to hand off our venues to their venue pastors right now. They'll share a couple things with you.